All right, love of the links. This is season two, episode six. We're starting to get some uh, momentum going, Bobby. I know both you and I got a lot going on, so we haven't really stuck to that weekly show that we had talked about, but how's everything in your world? Things are good. We're uh, reimagining golf is moving forward with a lot of nice projects and helping people uh, look at a different way to experience the game of golf. That's what we're all about. So um, yeah, we're off to a good start. Uh, looking at our first golf course acquisition, pretty big name. We'll announce that. Maybe we'll announce it on this show. There It'll be go. an exclusive. Nice. Um, you'll be wicked excited. I will be wicked excited. I've been, I've been uh, following you from behind the scenes and I'm excited for you because you know, you and I have very much in common as far as how uh, how the game should be enjoyed by people, how we should manage our operations at our facilities, uh, and our guests tonight, they're going to have some insight too in that, in that same vein and of, of how we go about making people enjoy the game, and that's basically making them play the game as good as they possibly can play. So that's kind of going to be our focus tonight. Uh, we're going to have uh, Charlie King top 100 instructor, and uh, Brad Turner, my former boss at the Golf Academy of America. So they'll come on here in a few minutes. But Bob, I, I was thinking before we, um, as we were leading up to get started today, I was looking at uh, Charlie's book and looking at some other books. I don't think you and I have ever on, on air talked about our philosophies. I know junior golf is a big part of what you, both you and I do, but from the standpoint of instruction what are some of your thoughts your philosophies uh on how instruction should be conducted well before i forget i can't wait to talk to brad about the um stories of you working together there's going to be some no really good ones uh that's, that's off limits <laughs> well you know brandon it's uh it's the usual thing of golf instruction keep your head down your left arm straight next yeah. question please yeah that's it um, you know, I had the luxury of growing up with a PGA Pro dad, 53 years. Um, I saw a lot of the old school teaching philosophies. I played golf with a lot of that generation that PGA pros uh, that were getting there into the game in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, so I've, I've said many times I got a foot in the old school, foot in the new school. I certainly embraced everything that's new about instruction, even, the, even terminology wise, going to more coaching. Uh, versus just getting a lesson. I know that doesn't sound a sexy, and it, it turns a lot of people off. I don't need a lesson. What are you going to change? Um, you know, certain words I use like evolution, evolve. Uh, let's try this. Um, certainly, a lot of. I just try to soak up from the Brads, the Charlies, the the, the best of the best out there, and put it in my own little way. And uh, there's a great quote, a couple of great quotes uh, that I believe were attributed to Tommy Armour. Uh, from years ago. One was, you should teach somebody a quarter of what you think they can handle, mm -hmm. because that's usually half too much. Yeah, yeah. And the other one's a pretty neat one. Uh, PGA instructor should understand the golf swing in total complexity to teach it in utter simplicity. And I've always liked that one, um, to be able to look and help somebody and coach or instruct them. And maybe it's just, it is a proverbial tweak this, tweak that. Um, I've done a lot of my golf instruction with new golfers to the game, and I really embrace new people to the game. Can't spell the game. Uh, can't, can't spell the word golf. That's okay. They feel like they might even be unsafe on a golf course. That's okay. I, I just like to get my arms around people, put a hand on a shoulder, help them get into the game, and, and learn to play the game. And I say play the game, uh, not work at the game per se. And But as you get better at it, um, yeah, there's more instruction, more levels of uh, understanding how to perform the golf motion. Um, so I, I'm, I, I take a lot of from a lot of different people in my own experience and uh, depends on where somebody is on the pathway. Are they introductory, midway? Mm -hmm. Are they new to the game? Physical attributes, some people uh, tight as a drum, you know, and then they, they've said it to you, Charlie, to everybody. Yeah, I want to swing like Tiger. And they, they can't even bend over to pick up a club, so... Yeah. How's that going to work? Yeah. And, and, you know, I, over the course of the six, seven years I was at the golf Academy of America, I personally learned a lot. Um, I know, I know Brad and Charlie worked a lot together on uh, putting the skills testing that they did at the golf Academy of America together. And, and I, I think that is a big part of 
instruction in terms of somebody truly wanting to get better. They have to benchmark things. They have to, they have to have a pathway. And I think too many instructors don't look at things that way. They, they like the onesies and twosies, which I can't stand having onesies and twosies lessons. I, I always do with all the juniors I work with from on a private standpoint, it's, it's three months, six months, nine months, or 12 months. You're committing to this because it's obviously we had Dr. Bob Winters on last week and it's a very difficult game and you can't expect or anticipate to get to a certain level without putting some commitment and time to it. So that's the first and foremost thing that I make people understand before they get going with me. And then something I know that, that Charlie, and I'm excited when he, when he gets on here and starts talking about this, it's there's not one way of swinging a golf club. It, it, you have to adapt uh, to your student. I mean, one of the first questions, and I'm sure you ask, and I'm sure you know, a lot of instructors ask, are there any physical limitations? And that right there cannot, if, if it's a system that you buy into, whether it's stack and tilt, and again, I'm not saying anything bad about these systems, they work for people, but not everybody, they don't work for everybody. So that you have to adapt your teaching to the person, the individual from a physical standpoint, and also from the standpoint of how they process information, uh, how they take in information, how you teach, the styles of teaching, the styles of learning. That's a big part of all that too. And, and I'm sure that's definitely a lot of the things you, you take into account too, Bob. Yeah, for sure. And, and I've changed up many things over the years. And I take a brand new person that can't spell golf and I take them on the golf course immediately. Mm -hmm. I want them to see the magic that's going on out there. And it's been done before i get to go to the driving range for so many lessons until you're ready yeah well you know maybe there's something there for some people but i i found vast vast um success with to your point you want to get somebody engaged for a while so if they can't see what's going on out there and they don't know the magic and the beauty and the exhilaration and they fall in love with the game because they're on a driving range uh, Year, I mean, 20 years ago, I just changed my home mentality. Hey, we're going out right out on that golf course. We're going to stand on the first green or whatever, look around, touch and feel the short grass. It's, it gets them really energized, energized and I, I get excited by that. And, you know, it, for the golf ecosystem, for the golf business, it's okay if somebody's out there, doesn't have the perfect grip, doesn't have the perfect stance, mm -hmm. can advance the ball, all oh. things, they're going to get better. Uh, but, yeah, it's, uh, I've definitely changed up in that regard. Yeah, and, and what exactly what you just said, you have to let them get on on the golf course pretty pretty quick. Almost, you know, that first initial lesson, get them out there. Because is there another sport that you can think of where you're not actually on the playing field? Uh, and that happens a lot. You see that a lot with, well, we have to start on the punting green. We have to start on the driving range. Well, you have to because why? Whoever said that that's the way it's supposed to be. So, you know, even if you're starting it, 20 yards away from the green, you know, letting them, like you said, see the magic, see what's out there, because that's the only thing that's really going to want them or want them to come back is, is seeing the game in its entirety. And yes, should you segment things as they're, as they're learning? Of course you should, but getting them out there on, on the golf course is, is vital. It's vitally important. So I'm yeah. interested, who's some, who's some of the, the folks that, as you were coming up as a PGA professional and just getting in the industry, what are some books or some, some instructors that, that you kind of gravitated towards? Uh, definitely my dad, yeah. you know, watching him. Um, he was amazing. There were other PGA pros that might have struggled with somebody and they sent them to my dad. So early on, I saw him helping others that weren't even members of his private clubs. So that was pretty interesting. Um, you know, the guy that's on our – right here, Charlie. I mean, I've, I've learned a lot from Charlie. I've read a lot of what he's done. Um, um, you know, Mike Hebron, kind of new age now with some of his thinking is, uh, is helpful. Um, certainly the Hogan book, I think everybody pretty much reads that and gets a nice uh, basis. Uh, Nicholas is my way. I mean, I've re read a lot of the books and – just sort of take what I think works with me or works how I can communicate that 
uh, with the people I work with. And not everything, as you know, is for everybody. Um, I don't know. I, yeah, it just, I'm, I'm having a brain cramp on so many names. Um, but there's just, you know, I, I just keep watching it. Certainly you watch things on TV. I, I hope we can do a podcast one time and, and almost maybe watch, like let you and I or have a guest come on and let us be the announcer to watch what's happening on a tour. Ooh. Uh, telecast, cause I, I, I do that myself. Uh, and I've done it in my golf shop and people have said, hey, you should be on there because I come at it a different way. I like that. That that's a good idea for maybe maybe when we get one of the folks from the golf channel on that get paid to do that for a living, we can see how we measure up with them. Oh, yeah. Um I, I was thinking that some of the um some of the folks in and I'm not I'm not gonna age myself here, but um my grandfather was the first influence. My father and my grandfather were my first influences, like most people to get into the game. And my dad had a book, Gay Brewer. Uh, it was a, a lot of illustrations in the book. It was a, it was a lot like Hogan's book, The Five Fundamentals. Um, so I gravitated to those two books. Jack Nicholas's Golf My Way was, was one for sure. Remember Bob Mann, uh, Automatic yeah. Golf, the video yeah. series. And then, uh, it, it was interesting. I did a lot. I looked at a lot of when I was a kid, Wally Armstrong stuff. And I actually oh, yeah, got yeah. to know Wally yeah. uh, when I moved down here to Florida. He's a, he, he loves teaching. And, and I think anybody that's a, that's an instructor and has been for a long time, you definitely have to have a passion about it. But Wally yeah. really, really loves teaching. That's a good point because I think it is like medicine for the right person, the right dose, finding the right prescription. Wally, Dr. Gary Wyron with yep. the teaching age, teaching aids. Um, not every aid is right for every person in every situation. That gets back to that Tommy Armour quote, uh, to know an impact bag is right for Charlie King because of one symptom in his swing, but the next 99 people you don't use it with because it didn't make sense for them or maybe that's uh, not, you know, but just give an example that, you know, I think Wally and uh, Dr. Wyron did, did a nice job getting the idea of the the swing aids out there, and you mm -hmm. probably created a few. We've we've all come up with a few. I I still use to this day. Yeah, and I, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, of of some of the old school training aids, and and uh, I love the the website that Dr. Ryan did with all the training aids and stuff. And I'm always I'm I'm on there almost every day. I think I get the newsletter that comes out weekly, and he's got a lot of a uh, lot of the stuff that's out there, and love uh jumping on there and checking out the newest and greatest stuff um yeah. so mr turner's jumped on so charlie stepped away as soon as mr <laughs> turner <laughs> jumped on. let me uh let me introduce our guest as we continue the conversation uh brad turner bradley how are you sir my former boss at the golf academy of america how are things with you is he on mute can you hear me, Brad? Can you hear me? Yes, there he is. We got him. He was always a tech technological genius when uh, when I worked with, worked for him. Uh, so, Bradley, how are you? Can you hear I'm me? I'm doing pretty good. Nice to see you. you nice too. to see you, Charlie. Hey, hey, how are you, Bob? So, uh, nice. Bob and I have already started the conversation okay. about. Um, some of our influences coming up uh, with instruction when we were play, playing as, as uh, juniors, what are some of the stuff that we read? I'm going to kind of get into what yours and Charlie's background is, uh, who maybe some of your influence was, influences were when you were junior golfers and you were coming up. And uh, in that same vein, what kind of pushed you to working in the business? We'll start with Charlie. Yeah, I uh, kind of an unusual, you know, with Bob growing up around golf, um, you know, I I grew up playing basketball and I'm still a NBA basketball nutcase. I've got the NBA league pass. I'm constantly watching basketball and looking at stats and and uh, but at 19, I, I don't know, somehow I saw I'm like, you know, I love sports and. I don't know, you know, your your basketball days are somewhat numbered as your knee starts to wear out. And uh, I had a buddy and a, a couple of buddies, and I saw them back in my hometown. I said, hey, why don't you guys take me golfing? 
And, um, you know, I mean, a typical first round of golf, not no good, uh, topping, chunking, slicing. And, uh, but I don't know, somehow I got the bug and, and, but didn't have any instructions. So the next three years, I'm a slicer, you know, I mean, I, I needed, I needed enough room down the left side for my big, big banana sweeping slice, you know, to start. And, uh, and then a, a friend at, in college that played on the golf team showed me how to hit a draw, how to hit a hook. And um, I thought he was a genius. I thought in to out was the key to golf, you know, so, or the secret to golf. And, and I, I picked up 15 yards with every iron. I picked up 30 yards with my driver. And, and, and in no time at all, my, my little draw turned into a big sweeping hook. And, uh, and that's what I, when I got the wild hair that I was going to go to Florida and chase a dream of, and, a, and, a, and I mean, a pipe dream of trying to be a player because I really didn't have the background. Uh, there wasn't enough room down the right side of the fairway for my ball to start. Um, and uh, so, you know, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get into my issues, you know, in trying to find a teacher and, and that kind of thing. But my start was late and kind of unusual for someone who ends up in the golf business. Bradley, how about you? Well, I, I, was, I would say I was a typical kid got introduced to the game with my dad, you know, we'd go out and play. I, I remember I played all the sports, played baseball, football, basketball. I loved all the sports, golf. He introduced me to golf. We'd play a couple times in the summer. And then uh, I think when I was 10, he got me a junior membership to Indian Tree Golf Club in Arvada, Colorado. And at that point, it was a great babysitter for my mom to drop me off at the golf course. And I really learned by playing, you know, we didn't really have the hit range balls, so I would play a lot of golf. Um, but it, and, and that's really how I developed. I didn't have any idols other than Jack Nicklaus was my idol even in those days. You know, you would watch him on TV. I can specifically remember watching the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach when he hits that iron um, close to the hole on 17. So I was the kid that would get Golf Digest back in those days and I couldn't wait to get it. And then I would read everything that, you know, whatever Jack said, you know, that's, I'm gonna do whatever Jack says, at least to the best of my, you know, my ability. So that's how, that's how I grew up. I grew up on a municipal golf course. Uh, there was a PGA professional, but he really didn't teach. He was more of the, the manager of the facility. So uh, I would look at all the good players that were older than me and, try to figure out how they did things. I was very observant of how, how people, you know, played the game. And I tried to copy some no-name people from Midland, Michigan that were good, you know, amateur golfers. And my first real introduction to a professional was when I went to college. I got a scholarship to play at Bowling Green State University. And that was my first coach that was a PGA professional that I could act, actually ask questions. And, you know, didn't know anything other than ball ground contact, um, stay in balance, uh, have a flat left wrist, and that's about it. I didn't know much at all. But the good thing is those things that I chose to focus on, you know, got me a college golf scholarship, plus a lot of practice, too. You know, it's interesting that you said that Jack was one of your influences. Um, yeah. One of the classes that I taught at the golf academy was career development. And I remember we were doing LinkedIn. We were going through LinkedIn with some of the students. And before we got into that, I said, has anybody ever Googled themselves? So I said, Brad was sitting in the class that day. So I said, let's Google Brad Turner. First thing that comes up on Google search for Brad uh, was PGA Tour, Bradley Turner. I can't remember which PGA Tour event it was that you played in. Yeah. But you got a little embarrassed when, when I brought that up and pulled that up. But you told me a story after, afterwards about uh, seeing Jack in the locker room. You want to tell that story? Yeah, well, that was – yeah, not too many people know this story. Charlie probably doesn't know this story. Maybe I've told Charlie this one. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, I played in the Great Milwaukee Open. I four-spotted, and that was, you know, a thrill to be playing – in a PGA Tour event, and it just so happened it was the first time Jack ever played um, at the Greater Milwaukee Open. And of course, 
I'm so excited about being there. The whole, you know, the six dozen golf balls in the locker, the gloves. I mean, this is fantastic. My name on the locker and even my idols playing golf. My first PJ Tour event, I get to play against Jack, right? Uh, or so I thought. But anyway, um, that was a tremendous experience for me. Um, you know, I learned a lot. And Jack obviously was there at my first uh, on Thursday, the first round, I was teeing off on one, Jack was on 10, and I'd never seen so many people in my life uh, watching Jack. They weren't watching me, of course, but they were watching Jack play. And I finished my first round, and I shot 71, and Jack happens to shoot 70. And my dad was at the scoreboard just, you know, he can't believe that I'm only one shot behind my idol, you know. And I'm thinking, my God, Dad, we got a long ways to go. And of course, I end up missing the cut, uh, and Jack finished the second. But anyway, I did see Jack. Um, actually, was walking out of the locker room, and he was heading to his car. And he and he sees me. I'm kind of like staring at him in awe. And he and he nods at me, and I just kind of nod back, and I go to my car. And I think I kind of regret to this day. I, I ran up to him, and said something, but I, I never did. And I said, well, I'll do it the next few that, that never really happened. So, um, but yeah, he was, he was uh, an intimidating person to me. I saw him playing PGA Tour events and he, he would make the hair on my skin stand up. You know, that's, that's who he was to me. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that story when you told me that. So I want to transition. I got a couple questions written down. And I know the two of you um, worked quite a bit together on, uh, I got Charlie's book here. And it's funny because Bob, Bob was looking for his copy of the book too, but I got the uh, Red Zone and a lot of good stuff in there. But I, I, as I went through that, and Brad, this is your copy, by the way, if you were looking for it, that I took uh, out of your office. <laughs> I was wondering where that went. No, I, I don't know where I got it. Um, but the idea of, and Bob and I were talking about this before, uh, before we got going, the idea of it's the importance of players kind of benchmarking where they are so they can, can progress. And a lot of the junior golfers I work with, I'm sure all of you have had students that this concept is kind of foreign uh, of knowing where you're at, measuring where you're at, so you can go forward. So what, could you guys kind of, either one of you kind of talk on that? You want me to take that, Charlie? Yeah, Brad, you go first. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll go ahead with that. So we'll go back to uh, Charlie. I started working at the Golf Academy of America in 1991. Charlie came in in 1992. Um, we've had about 120 or 30 students, and it was just Charlie and myself as the main golf instructor. So Charlie taught um, a golf instruction class that was focused primarily in the full swing and I focus more on the short game and I can rem as I recall Charlie I may be off on this but as I recall we were struggling to teach all these kids you know you know 120 30 kids only two of us so we ended up creating what we called skills development so skills development was small groups and I focused on short game and Charlie focused on the full swing and it matched up with the curriculum that we were doing in the classroom. So that was, that was great. So Charlie talked about the golf swing and then practical application out on, on the driving range and me, same thing with, with the short game, okay? And then in 1992, I think we were at the coaching <clears throat> and teaching summit in San Francisco and there was a PGA professional there, Jerry Tucker was explaining his short game skills uh, test that he did for his members at Bell Reeve in St. Louis and I remember Charlie just that was like the light bulb went off in his mind and we have to do skills testing we have to do short game skills testing and we went back after that and that, that was the the great thing about what was happening back then is we had lots of autonomy to do what we felt was right for this no, my, my superiors, they just kind of let us decide, really. And that, that's what we, we started doing. So the skills test was a big staple of, you know, communication with the, with the students on 
on where they are, where they want to be, benchmarking, as you're saying. And, and Charlie's been using it for the last 20 some years, right, Charlie? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, and kind of fill in some of the blanks there on that story is that, um, you know, in 90 at Nashville at the Teaching Summit, Mike Hebron, speaking to Mike Hebron just a few minutes ago, but he got up and told us about Jerry Tucker. Then in, you know, he said, hey, there's a guy at Bell Reeve that has lowered his students' handicaps by an average of two strokes, you know, and that's significant. And, and so the, but the thing about it too was it was a skill test and he turned it into a handicap, right? Because those numbers would be arbitrary. I mean, what does it mean if you get six points in the chipping test? Is that good? Is that bad? I mean, what does it mean? And, and so uh, Craig Shanklin, who's one of my mentors, um, he knows Jerry Tucker. So I asked him, I said, can you get me the test? He got it for me. And it's a great test. But for what we were doing, we couldn't use it because it took too long. And so we had to create our own test. And so Coach Conrad Railing, who was with us a month every semester, coach from his coaching background was always on our case. You guys need to be skill testing. You guys need to be skill testing. And then a fateful phone call with Dr. Rick Jensen had something to do with it as well because Rick – so so whenever I, I was at the golf academy, I didn't like the fact that it was just sign-up sheets to get lessons. I said, well, that, some guy could go through 16 months and not get good at golf, you know, and leave here and, and he has the stamp of approval and they have a terrible grip, terrible posture, hitting a big old slice. Yep, Charlie and Brad are my teachers, you know. <laughs> And um, so I called Rick Jensen, Dr. Rick Jensen, and I said, hey, Rick, we want to create a program, but honestly, I don't know how to create a program. I really don't even know where to start. And, and, and I thought he would tell me some academic book to read, but Rick said, Charlie, it's really not that complicated. Take martial arts, take musical instruments, take skiing, take tennis, take golf, take swimming, anything that is a motor movement Here's how it works. Take the big skill and, and break it into its component skills and determine the hierarchy of skills. I said, nice, nice PhD word, hierarchy of skills. And, and he said, but that just means order of importance. And so we went through that exercise and Brad and I went through that exercise and, and, and we put it on a piece of paper. And so we we had kind of the short game version of it, and we had the, the ball striking version of it. And so short game, we said, well, the simplest thing would be a one-foot putt or a half-foot putt, whatever you want to say. So let's say a one-foot putt. So what's the most important skill? Well, we said it's face angle. What's the second most important skill? Speed. What's the third most important skill? Well, a distant third is path because path wouldn't make much difference on a one-foot putt. Centered hits wouldn't make much difference on a one foot putt, you know. So anyway, so then we went back to a 10 foot putt and we said, well, it's, it's still face angle and, and speed is still second. Then we went back to a 30 foot putt. We said, well, now speed's number one, face is number two. You know, path matters because it's delivering the face, you know, hitting it on the same place on the club. Because one of the things Rick would harp on me, he said, Charlie, if there's a bunch of exceptions to what you're saying, you ought to figure out a way to not have an exception. I said, well, Aoki hits it on the heel every time. So I can't say sitter, right? It's gotta be the same place. And, and so anyway, we, and then we said, now there's a lofted club, right? So, so a chip shot and then a pitch shot. And then once we got to the pitch shot, then it kind of transitioned over to ball striking. And so path, face, blah, blah, blah. So we came up with our essential skills and it was uh, – so then we were able to create the skill development program because now we said, okay, we got to build this skill this week, you know, and then we had two weeks, so they got one full swing, one short game. And so we did the skill test at the beginning. We did 10 weeks of skill development. Then we did the skill test at the end. And every single time it was unbelievable. And after, you know, I was there 92 to 2000, then Brad was there until the Golf Academy uh, finished uh, a year ago. But the number stayed the same, 75% overall improvement. That, that, I mean, that just – that was so mind-boggling to me because I always felt like it validated our test, you know, that, 
a, a statistician could look at our test and go, well, you guys don't have enough hitting 10 balls per place is not enough balls. That It's not statistically relevant. And it's like, well, guess what? It's, it's close enough to statistically relevant. And the fact that we've done it for years is what proves its relevancy. Mm-hmm. And anyway, we create our own handicap chart. And, and so that was part of their grade, right? So, I mean, the thing about that was we were able to make it mandatory. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of data over the year. Brad, did you, did you keep all that data? No, oh, I hate to say that. I was, just, I was just thinking about it when I was listening to Charlie there. I had all the data from the early 90s. I had, you know, 20-some years of data that I failed to copy. Um, but I, I will tell you this, that I, I, I know the test so well that, you know, when it comes to someone scoring – a certain number, an overall number, it, it does give you a very good glimpse of where they are from a short game standpoint. So if someone, back to the handicapping that Charlie's talking about, if, if the short game handicap on the skills test was a was a nine and their, their actual handicap's a four, then we clearly know an opportunity yeah. for that player is, yep. is to really work on the short game. And then con- converse, it could be the opposite way as well. So. It's not always, not, not everyone needs to work on the short game, believe it or not. Most people will benefit, but there are some people that need to strike the golf ball better. You know? So the test, we use the test for so long, and, um, and I know Charlie still uses the test, and uh, I'm trying to get that implemented where I'm at now. Yeah. At IJ. Well, you know, what's interesting, too, is um, you know, when the, the book Golf's Red Zone Challenge came out, I was able to do – that brand so to speak with a three-day golf school and what was so interesting to me is that over the years of giving the test to individuals or to small groups right we were giving them the big groups at the golf academy what's been so interesting to me is that half the time the short game handicap will match their actual handicap which is so, I mean, it just amazes me. You know, I give them a skill test and the handicap's a 12. And I say, well, what's your handicap? And they say, it's a 12. <laughs> I go, okay. <laughs> and when I would do the three-day school, when I would do the three-day school, where normally it's about half the time it'd be the same handicap, nine out of 10 or, or 40, Six times out of 50, a person who came to the short game school, their short game handicap was worse than their actual handicap. I mean, absolute proof that they came to the right school, you know, that they they needed short game. Short game was what was holding them back. So um, anyway, just there's just so much data, both when we were at the Golf Academy and then when I've been using it kind of in regular – uh, instruction and different things that um, I mean it, it it bears out you know it bears out and now the uh, in the uh, PGA the three well I was in 2.0 and now 3.0 the education uh, they have they have half of that skill test as uh, as one of the uh, outdoor training activities you know to show skill testing so you know Something that we're something that we're all proud of, you know, and and it's kind of um, it 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 didn't become as like Dave Pell's famous, but I I think it's had uh, a great effect within the industry. You know, uh, I, I I get comments all the time. People tell yeah. me we use it in our college team, we use it in our junior program, we use it here, there, and everywhere. And so you know that's. That's what we wanted, you know. That's what we wanted. We wanted it to to make a difference, and and it does. Hey, Charlie and uh, Brad, I wanted to uh, pick your brain a little bit on something. I, I know for my golf instruction over the years, when somebody would come in years ago, it was a little more golf focused, obviously. Uh, but then I started saying, "Hey, Charlie, did you play other sports?" Yeah, I played tennis. What from the sport of tennis can translate over to golf with motions, mindset? Hey, Brad, did you play other sports? Yeah, I played football. What position or so uh, I know lately with the long-term athletic development, PJ's uh, going down the road on that more, which is good. Um, what are your thoughts on the benefits that we're starting to see with multi-sport athletes that are – I know for me with hockey especially, there's certain shots I can think of 
because I played hockey, my balance helped me with the shot. Crazy situation. I only hit it off the ferry once or twice, but in those situations, that's what happened. But yeah, I just wanted to get your feeling on the idea of how do other sports translate into golf? How do you help people with that? Yeah, I, I, I'll take it first and then hand it over to Brad. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, my experience has been hockey is probably number one as far as transfer. Uh, field goal kicking is way up there. I mean, you look at how many good, how many field goal kickers are good because it's funny how far I was in the teaching business before it dawned on me that a club face is a foot analogy. Yes. The heel and the toe, and I go, <laughs> how many times did I say heel and toe, and it never dawned on me oh, yeah. that the analogy is a foot. I mean, it never dawned on me at all. And one day it hit me, I'm like, goodness. So, uh, Charlie, I don't, I don't mean to cut in, but literally yeah. last night, <laughs> uh, a fairly newer student who's a soccer player. It was the conversation we were having just last night. So continue. Yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, tennis, the hand-eye coordination stick and ball, baseball players, I would say, especially the pull hitters, the, the left field hitters, they come to golf slicing. Now they come to golf, hit, I mean, they come to golf with tons of club hit speed, but they come to it slicing because they open up so quickly um, it, it's not as, it's not as much about path cause you're swinging, you know, to the left. It's, you know, it's not face awareness because it's hitting it on the barrel. And so they, they come in without face awareness, but they come in with tremendous hand eye coordination. So the funny one, let me tell you a real, a, I think it's funny <laughs> is that I was teaching at Nantucket and I had told one of the members that the sport that doesn't have much transfer to golf is basketball. Right, because it's not a stick. There's not a ball, you know. I mean, it's it's this athleticism, but not hand-eye stick ball athleticism. And so, wouldn't you know? At the next weekend, this guy's friends with Danny Ainge, <laughs> and so he says to Danny Ainge, he says, "Hey, Danny, Charlie says there's no transferable skill from basketball to whatever." And and, and Danny Ainge says, "F Charlie." So. <laughs> I'll turn it over to you, Brad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would agree with everything that Charlie said. said. Uh, in 1985, I worked one summer up in uh, Marquette, Michigan. And I was there only one summer. I was, you know, the pro that was, it was a good friend of mine, and he invited me to come up and, and teach all summer long, play in tournaments. And I went up there, and no one really wanted to take that. You know, I gave some lessons, but not nearly what I thought I was going to give. And... I never saw so many good players at a club, and I, I didn't know what it was. It took me quite a while. I mean, there were single digits everywhere, it, it, just all kinds of single digits, and they could make a nice athletic move. And it finally, it probably took a couple months before I realized it's hockey, because they all play hockey in the winter. And then when the stick awareness, you know, and I will say this about hockey players, I never played hockey. Uh, I played basketball like Charlie did. I wish I would have played hockey. It would have been a better sport for me because we can skate, don't have to jump. Um, but <laughs> man, oh man, the, the face awareness of a hockey player, you got to be very, virtually every hockey player I've seen is pretty good, pretty good. And they're the best athletes in my, you know, to me when it comes to hand-eye coordination, the physical game that hockey is and the speed at which they play the ability to pass a puck just blows my mind so hockey players totally agree with Charlie on that one baseball players all slice it I've had many conversations at parties when someone finds out that I'm a golf pro you know a teacher and I found out they played baseball through college and I say well you slice it don't you well how did you know and I you know they think I'm psychic because I know baseball players like, but Charlie's exactly right with that one. So these transferable skills that we talk about are, are really, really important. So I, I played, you know, tennis is one of my favorite transferable skills because it deals with spinning, spinning the tennis ball or spinning the ping pong ball. And my analogy is always just kind of flipping the axis, so to speak. So in tennis is swing down to up with the face of the racket down towards the ground. That produces a top spin in golf. We'd call that, you know, end out with the face closed. That's a draw. 
and I've had my best all-time lesson I ever gave in one hour was a guy that was a you know, A-level tennis player that had never broken 80 in his life, was about a 16 handicap, 19 handicap, something like that. And I explained to him, I said, if you're, really, if you're an A-tennis player, you can do a top spin and you can do a back spin. He goes, oh yeah, I can do all that. Well, then you can hook a golf ball in. And it took about 20 minutes and he, he was doing things he didn't know but that he could do. I just used tennis thoughts and he went out and shot 78 that day. And man, I was the miracle worker. Now, I will say that's the best lesson I ever gave. I don't think I ever gave another one quite like that. Um, but that's what can happen when you give the right concept and you give people the right picture of what they're supposed to do. People are more talented than what you see on the range. They just don't know how to do it. And, that, and you need good coaching to get them to understand. You know, so you know it's interesting. Yeah. It, it, as a quick aside, I've been around a lot of NHL players, hockey players I played. Behind me, you can see my favorite team. <laughs> best, best in the league right now, just as an aside. But anyways, <laughs> uh, but it's interesting that the hockey players I know and I've taught some and been around, how they play hockey, you look and go, wow, they play golf like they play hockey. If they're a rough and tumble fighter, they're kind of a crazy swing. Uh, guys like John Rattel, John Rattel played for the Rangers and the Bruins. He worked for my dad for a while. John, single digit, really, really good player. Mr. Class, uh, Lady Bing, you know, like just really smooth. His swing is like that. I just found it fascinating hockey players wise. Uh, it, how they do hockey translates over to golf. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Sure. Does. So, so my question is, and, and Bob, I'm glad you brought that up. How do you work with a student that has no body awareness, no athletic, not a drop of athleticism in them? What would be one of the first places you start with a, with a brand new golfer in that situation? Charlie, you want that one or you want me to go? Your, your turn to start first. My turn to start, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, okay? And I, I would tell you, in the ideal world, I would not put a golf club in their hand, okay, at first. And I would suggest that you get them to kind of understand big, big muscle movement, you know, what I would call the pivot, kind of the general idea of how we stand and how we rotate our shoulders back and kind of rotate through. And if they're not real athletic, they probably don't have a, you know, a good kinematic sequence by, you know, playing other sports, which they might be able to transfer to golf. So the kinematic sequence, meaning, you know, as you move forward, the lower body has to move a little bit towards the target, rotate, and you just get them to make those motions. And then I would probably get just a stick in their hand, like a, like a broomstick or something, and have them hit a big old ball of some kind and yep. just try to hit it hard and as hard as they can hit it and just that and try to get some kind of directional target for them to kind of understand to kind of swing the stick kind of in this particular direction whatever you may have them do um, and see if you can get something going that would be good because if you give them a golf club and a little golf ball, and you ask them to start swinging. I think it's a recipe for disaster. But Charlie, I don't know what your thoughts are on that one. Yeah, it's um, you know, you, and that's one of those funny things. Like, is do they have any transferable skill? You know, I mean, did they play ping pong? Did they shoot pool? Did they throw darts? Did they throw horseshoes? Did they, you know, like? Like when you get to that situation where a person didn't do anything athletic at all, I mean, you as the teacher have to be amazingly patient and the student has to be amazingly patient. And, um, you know, sometimes in that case, the person, I've had it happen a couple times in my career where the person after I work diligently and I mean, that's something I always take pride in, whether it's, you know, uh, a high, you know, a higher level, you know, plus handicap player or a beginner, um, you know, I'm going to give it a hundred percent effort every lesson because it's all relative in terms of, uh, helping that person. 
And so I've had it happen a couple of times where the person discovered through taking lessons and trying that there was so much time necessary to overcome the fact that they just, they just didn't play any sports at all, you know? And, and so you're almost taking them back to their childhood. And so how many years of basic motor movement stuff, right? The stuff we see with the long-term athletic development, the rolling, the tumbling, the skipping, you know, all that stuff, uh, jumping rope. Um, so, um, you know, and, and, and if a person has some transferable, I had a total beginner last week and uh, it was, you know, I wish I'd done a better job of, of taking pictures of it. I mean, I've got it on video, but I, with her being a beginner, I didn't do the initial video because, I mean, it would just been an initial video of, you know, a, a blob of a swing, right? I mean, she just had no picture at all. And uh, kind of to Brad's point, um, you know, I, I, I really was building structure into her swing. So the head is centered. Here's how the body turns. Here's how, here's the radius of the swing. Here's kind of when the wrist hinge. Let's clip a lot of tees. Let's see if we can contact tees before we try to hit the ball. And, um, you know, and then the first lesson was a lot of, I mean, we probably never made it past a half swing. And, uh, but by, you know, but she, she, she hit a couple of them good enough. She's like, I'm, I'm going to come again tomorrow, you know? And so then she yep. comes again tomorrow and we made a little progress and then, she comes the next day and she made a little progress. And I mean, by lesson four, she was so proud. I was so proud. I mean, you know, I mean, the swing looked good and it was making contact most of the time. And, and, and but she, but different slightly than the discussion, she was a tennis player, you know? And so she had some speed and explosiveness from swinging that tennis racket. And she had some hand-eye coordination once you got the golf part of the coordination, you know, over to her. Um, so I don't know. That's a, I would say it's somewhat of a rarity, right, to get that person who really doesn't have – they just didn't play sports. They didn't – and, I mean, they – not only did they not play sports, I mean, they just didn't do basic skipping, yeah. running, jumping, I mean, playing – and, and so, you know, because, I mean, the, the most basic transferable skill is kind of walking, right? You did walk here today, right? So, you know, I mean, so, you know, I mean, just the, the idea of going from one foot to the other foot, I mean, you did it all the way here. So that's there. But then the idea of holding the club and, and kind of swinging in that tilted over circle and being able to come back to the spot, uh, a lot of patience necessary on both sides on both sides and then but that person who's willing to put the time in I'm willing to put the time in and yep. and hope you know we'll get there and then the person who after they give it their best college try and I give it my best college try and they go you know what I appreciate everything you did but golf's not for me I mean that's that's a reality too yeah mm -hmm. hey Bob I kind of had a feeling that this was going to be our longest podcast because I'm really <laughs> enjoying this so well, this will, folks, this will be our longest one because I got a couple more questions and I'm sure you do too. Um, so as I'm looking at my list here, I'm going to cross off a few because we would be on for another hour or so. But I want to ask you guys what your feelings of the future of the game is in terms of instruction or it could be just the business side. I know Brad and I had a lot of conversations at the Golf Academy about the business side of things and observations we've had over the years about how things uh, could be better uh, just from an operational standpoint and a marketing standpoint. Uh, but mm -hmm. with more of the focus on instruction tonight, what do, you, what do you guys think the future of our game is? And to answer that, you're probably going to have to take a glimpse back at how instruction was previously versus what it is today. I guess it's my turn to start first. Yeah, your, your turn. <laughs> um, you know, so back to that that uh, that phone call in 1993 with Dr. Rick Jensen, I, I still feel so fortunate. And, and again, that phone call happened because I was fortunate to be around Brad and be at the Golf Academy, and, and we were thinking big picture kind of stuff. And, and so, you know, my teaching background had been with a national golf school. So Swings the Thing Golf School, which mm -hmm. just basically doesn't exist anymore 
or in it in its form as Swings the Thing Golf School does not exist anymore. But what a great way to learn how to teach. What a great way to get the experience. And and so then when I go to the golf academy, there's just a lot of things I knew that a person who didn't teach three years, I mean, like all day long, day after day after day after day, you know, wouldn't know. But one thing that that no matter about the new technology or the old teaching, the thing where I got lucky was that conversation where Rick told me about skills, you know? So once I realized that I'm a motor skill teacher, right? I identified myself as a motor skill teacher. Then every time I looked at somebody, see, I didn't see like a bunch of wacky stuff. I just looked at them and I said, okay, what's the number one skill this person's missing? You know, and, I, and because I had done the hierarchy of skills and we had done the hierarchy of skills, then, you know, okay, if they're not hitting it solid, it's this and this is the key. And then if they're, if they're hitting a slice, then we're going to fix that face and the path. And if they're hitting a hook, we're going to fix the face and the path, you know, and we're going to give them a better concept. So um, what's happened in terms of, let's say, the modern and the future is now there's things I can measure that I used to not be able to measure as well. So when I started using TrackMan five years ago, um, I just had no idea what was about to happen as far as fixing a slice. So I mean, you know, you spend your whole career fixing slices. And so one of the things that you go through when you're fixing a slice is it feels weird to most people what you're asking them to do and they say, are you sure? That, is, I, that doesn't feel right. Are you sure? that? that can't be the answer. I mean, that's the answer to this. Oh my gosh, that just feels so weird. So, you know, as a teacher, you're ready for that. You have every counter in the world for, well, it's got to feel weird. It's going to, you know, it's, it's not, it's not something you're used to. Track man, I'm giving my first track man lesson, you know, so I'm just learning how to use track man and I'm learning how to read the numbers and kind of what the ranges are of where the path should be on a seven iron and what the smash factor should be and all that. And I still remember the guy I gave less to, and he was a long time student and I'd get him hitting a draw and then he'd, he'd leave for a month and he'd come back and he's hitting a cut again. And, uh, and so he looks at the path and I said, you're six degrees out to end with the face, five degrees, six degrees open to the path. He goes, I am, I'm six degrees out to end. I said, yeah, yeah, you're six degrees out to end. I can't believe that. Yeah. What do I need to do? Well, same thing we always do, but just more of it, you know, like let's do it. So he does it. And the next swing, which he thought was so exaggerated, it was two degrees out the end. He didn't say how weird it felt. He looks up at the screen and sees the number. He goes, that was still two degrees out the end. I said, yep, that was still. So I need to do it more. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. You need to do it more. And I'm telling you ever since that day with minor exceptions, when I use TrackMan to help get rid of slices, when I use TrackMan to help get rid of hooks, I don't get that. I People don't say that feels weird anymore. They just don't say it. They just get up, they do whatever I say, and they try to get that number to change. And when that number changes, the smash factor number changes and the, the carry number changes and the spin number changes and all that stuff changes. So yeah, that was amazing. But the cool thing is, if you're a skills teacher, nothing has changed. It's just different tools to build those skills. So that's kind of been my message to people over and over and over is, listen, are we not teaching a motor skill? Of course we are. A motor movement and a motor skill. Guess what that makes you? A teacher of motor skill. So do you understand how motor skills are taught and learned? If you do, this isn't, I mean, it's not easy, but it's not as hard. But if you don't think that way, see, you still see, 52 degrees of this and 47 degrees of that. And I, and I pay attention to all that stuff, but it's way overblown. And, and that, that golfer can be so lost if you go down that road too far. Yeah. Okay. So let me, let me add my, my two cents to that. Um, I would totally agree with what Charlie was saying that really nothing's changed as, as to what we need players to do. When I first started teaching, I'll go back to when I first started playing golf when I was 10, 11 years old. My dad was smart enough to know that he couldn't do it, that I needed to hit a ball and then I had to hit the ground afterwards. 
And he said, you got to take a divot. You got to take a divot. Why do I have to take a divot, Dad? I don't know, but you just got to take a divot. So I don't know how to take a divot. So I just saw some people doing it. And I tried to figure it out. And, and finally, I was able to hit the ball and then the ground. And I was like, Dad, man, I could do it. I took a divot. And the ball stopped on the green. And the divot needs to be towards your target. I mean, these are good things for a 10, 11, 12 year old kid to know right out of the gate. I didn't know much swing playing would have, I don't know what you're talking about. I know that I'm supposed to hit the back of the ball and then the ground. So to this day, I still teach people to hit the ball first and then the ground afterwards and orient that towards the target. That's the same thing that Ben Hogan did, Byron Nelson, they all knew that. Uh, but what we can do today, back in those days, people would look at the best players and think that the motion was the magic in the swing, but the magic was hidden at a high rate of speed, and no one really knew what was happening at impact. I mean, maybe, maybe players knew deep down how they had to do it, but teachers still were guessing. I, I still think it took till the, maybe the mid-80s to the 90s before we really, as a profession, started understanding what we need to be teaching. Because we now have technology to verify some of our thoughts or to, you know, prove things false that we thought were true. And TrackMan has been my favorite tool. Now, Charlie loves TrackMan. I love TrackMan. I'm a big club mechanics person. I like how a club is being swung. And that measures really what the club's doing. And what you're always looking for is a delivery of the club in an acceptable pattern and see if you can get it to repeat. So once you can create a good pattern, that, you know, track man numbers that are acceptable, can you repeat? How often can you repeat that? And, and there are some numbers that produce high ball flights, some fades, some draws. Um, and players have strengths and weaknesses that are on the PGA Tour and they're all great, right? So... And TrackMan tells you all this, it's right there for you if you want to look into it. But there's other things like KVEST and Body Track and Sandpot Lab. All this technology is fantastic. I think what it's done, it's made teachers more powerful as instructors because, as Charlie's example was perfect, I can't tell you how many people that would swing, you know, seven, eight degrees off of a, a zero plane or zero path line and be completely clueless to it. And you just let them work themselves back to zero and they can do it. Uh, and that would have never been, well, it's much easier with track now, for sure. So the future of golf is going to still lie in the technology that we have to help us teach, but there's no replacing the, the motor skill development, which takes time. Knowledge, you can know everything there is, about flying an airplane, pass the test, but if and I've never flown an airplane, but yet I know an airplane, are you getting in the airplane with me? And you're not, okay? And, and the same thing with golf. You may think you know a lot about golf and you may read a lot about golf, but how many times have you put a club against the ball? Do you understand really how it works? And motor skill there's really not a, I don't, I don't think there's a shortcut. I mean, there's probably better pathways to getting to a, a, a skill. Uh, and that's why we have coaches and teachers like Charlie's a top hunter teacher that can get people there quicker, but they still have to put the time in. Okay. And that, and that's, that's never, never going to change. I don't see it. And then one other, and just quickly, one other trend that I see, and I think it's because of, the proliferation of YouTube videos. I think it's because of GolfChannel.com. I think it's because of, you know, uh, Golf Twitter, uh, Golf Instagram, is that people are getting more satiated and think, you know, like that's replacing their golf lesson. Yeah. But what's going to happen is they don't really get better. I mean, I have not seen a trend as a teacher. I have not seen a trend of golfers being better uh, in two, 2020 than I used to see them show up in 2000 or 1990. Um, it, but, you know, they, there's, there's such a proliferation of that stuff. And then the other trend that I see 
is that not and it's always existed, but there was kind of both, meaning that there was the local uh, instructor, local uh, whatever, and then in the winter time, people would go to a golf school. You know, in Florida, they would go to a golf school, and and that business is just it is such a fraction of what it used to be, yep. and and I think part of that is that a, that people are getting more connected to their local instructor, and that local instructor has track man and has to a two bay building and and has enough where they go i'm good i'm good with what i've got and so when they they still go to florida they're just more likely to play they're more likely maybe to get a lesson right an individual lesson for something very specific and less likely to do the uh, three-day golf school which you know i was i was at pga national as director of instruction 02 and 03 and we we had, you know, thousand, thousand students a year, you know, those years. And um, that, that, that volume of business just doesn't exist anymore. And, um, and so I think one of the trends that I see is how important it is to, um, to build your, you know, like even if, if, you know, like right now I'm at Doral in Miami. Uh, and, and so it's almost flipped in a way where, it's now build your local business and supplement it with golf schools, corporate outings, and entertainment. So because of Top Golf, we're finding a tremendous golf entertainment evening business down here. And um, so that's, that's, you know, golf entertainment, uh, mixing those up well is, uh, is a good trend that's going on as well. So be, before I kick it over to Bob for, for his last question, just a couple observations and comments uh, as far as technology goes for me. Obviously, you guys know that juniors are kind of my bread and butter. I don't work sure. with any adults because they just don't listen. The kids listen. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the technologies that I use all the time with my students is something called Coach Now, or it's just an internal like Facebook between myself and them and the parents. But I, I'm trying to get some of my students to get more people collaborating, such as physical therapists they may go see or someone that they're, they're training with from the physicality standpoint of things. And, it, and it's not any different than what, what Charlie, what you were saying about the connectivity and they're just more connected and, and there's more of that availability because of technology. Um, Brad was known for a saying at the Golf Academy, Paifeo, um, this is a PG show, so we won't completely say what that means, but it's practice your blank in, blank off, and you can fill in the blanks. And, and you're right. Both of you guys are right. You can't, with all the technology that we have, to make it easier, I would say, for people to understand why things happen the way that they do, you can't replace putting in the time. And that's the constant conversation I have with my students. But luckily, it's, for me, making them understand what practice means. It's not beating balls on the range. It could be you standing in front of a mirror at your house for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, just practicing moves, the motor skills, like Charlie said. So I'm trying to make them understand that concept, that it's not always just beating balls. So, Bob, with that thought, what's, uh, what's the last question you have for our guests? Oh, I definitely to Brad. I want all the good stories about working with Brendan. <laughs> uh, the good stories with working with Brendan. Well, I'll tell you a story that this is what one, I learned a, uh, quite a few things from Brendan um, when he came to work. Uh, I knew that he was with little linksters and junior golf was his thing. And I thought, I thought selfishly that was an opportunity for the golf academy to improve a weakness that we had. Uh, which we didn't focus a whole lot on an important segment of the population. And, you know, I, I grew up playing golf. I played college golf. I still enjoy playing competitive golf. And Brendan, Brendan grew up in, loving golf in a different way. So I always encourage Brendan to play. <laughs> and, and, um, and he's busy, you know, because he was at the time, you know, he had a brand new job and, and he was the chapter president of, of the East Central chapter, the PGA. And then he had his side thing, which I wanted him to keep little Langsters going. And then we had P PGA Junior Golf League. And I said, boy, this guy's busy. 
you know, and he's running tournaments. And I would say, Brendan, you know, you really got to play more. I mean, I don't know why you don't want to play more. He goes, Brad, there's more than one way to love the game. And I love it just a little different than you. And I said, okay, I got it. Yeah, there's a you're different seeing, way. There's a different you're still way. not okay with that, though. <laughs> no, I've accepted it. I've accepted that I, there's more than one way of loving the game. And, and you love the game. Uh, I know you always spend a week at, the, at Augusta, which is a favorite place for myself. And, um, and you know, you're, you're a golf fan. You're a, golf, you're a great golf professional. And you are sharing your love of the game the way you want to do it. I get to do it, you know, my way. And uh, so I thank you for opening my eyes to new ways of, of loving the game. So you're going to teach some five and six year olds with me? No, I'm going to I'm going to <laughs> send them all to you though. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Brad. <laughs> Bob, any last questions? You know, I do want to have you guys on again for sure because <laughs> of the checklist I had here, we got to four out of ten things. So yeah, I appreciate your time. Any last thoughts, Mr. Baldessari? Yeah, it's just always a privilege, honor, pleasure to be with Brad and Charlie and. Keep learning from them, and uh, we definitely want to have you back on. Um, we, we, I have my own, my own list right here that I didn't get to all my questions, so we're going to have you back real soon. But thank you for being with us. Well, thank, thanks for the invitation. Um, I, I, I love doing stuff like this, and, and it's fun to, you know, exchange information and, uh, and, and tell a few stories and, and uh, go from there. So I'd gladly be on again. That'd be great. It was fun. Fun to be with Charlie. We haven't um, had a chance to do anything like this in probably 20 years. We've had lots of conversations, though. That's <laughs> and I've had lots of conversations with friends as well. So, Bob, it was nice to, to meet you and have a chance to, to chat. And, uh, yeah, and, and just to let you guys know, the, the, the reason Brendan asked me on is because I was complimenting uh, Dr. Bob Winters, who was on your show, and He's been a, a friend of mine and a guest of the Golf Academy. And I listened to the whole podcast, and it was fun to listen to. So uh, it got Charlie and I on the, on, the sh on your podcast. So thank you. Well, appreciate it, guys. And for our listeners, you can check us out, Love of the Links, on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. We'll have the video portion of this, uh, this episode coming out probably mid-morning tomorrow. Uh, I actually have a GAA graduate that helps me with the audio portion, um, Will Hoover. So it takes him a little bit longer, like it was for him to get his homework turned in, but it takes him a little bit longer to I do the audio portion for me. But uh, that will be coming out on all the places you can get your podcast. I, iHeartRadio, Pandora, iTunes. So look for that. Again, gentlemen, thank you, and everybody have a good night. Thank you. All right. You too. Thanks. Thank you.